The following interview was conducted with Professor Michael G. Rossman, the Hanley Distinguished Professor of Biological Sciences for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Monday, March the 31st, 2008, in Stewart B26. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Tell us where you were born and your parents and siblings in your early years. All right. Well, I was born in Frankfurt, Germany, Frankfurt on Main, Germany, and um, don't have any siblings. Um, so the first eight and a half years of my life were in Germany. Uh, my mother is of Jewish ancestry and my father was not. So this created a lot of problems for me in Germany at that time. It was in the 30s. Um, I went to public school, but actually my uh, mother was, uh, after about the third year, of their marriage were divorced, uh, nothing to do with uh, Nazism, uh, just a uh, divorce which could happen on, in any circumstance. Uh, uh, so I lived with my mother and grandmother, my mother's mother, uh, and I was considered by most of the other kids at school as uh, you know coming from a Jew Jewish home. So uh, I was. Uh, badly treated in many ways uh, by the teachers and kids, and I was constantly afraid. Um, now, my mother had actually joined uh, what was quite new for Germany, the Society of Friends, or Quakers, because uh, Quakers had come to Germany after the end of the First World War because of the famine and had uh, helped to uh, work with uh, people in Germany to ameliorate at least some of the feminine. So she had got to know uh, English Quakers or uh, members of Society of Friends. Um, and as a consequence, she was able to send me to a Quaker boarding school in Holland, which was a trilingual school, Dutch, English, and German. So at the age of about eight and a half, the beginning of 1939, uh, I was sent uh, to this school, boarding school, because uh, I was very young, I uh, wasn't very happy, and I just had had very poor experience in Germany. Um, it was difficult. But uh, then uh, my mother and grandmother were able to emigrate to England. Uh, you couldn't just travel in those days. Uh, you had to have a, uh, a financial support in England because it was at the time of the Depression. England didn't just take anybody. But there were a lot of uh, German... Jewish refugees in England who had managed to find some manner of support. Um, and while I was uh, in England in, in the in summer of 39, the war, Second World War, broke out, uh, and I couldn't return to, to Holland where my schooling had been paid for, which was a very good thing because uh, uh, none of the other Jewish uh, boys survived. Um, and um, uh, so I stayed in England. I grew up in school in England again in a Quaker boarding school, uh, which was, uh, you know, I was very happy there. Uh, and um, I continued to go to college in England. Where did you go to college in England? Well, actually, again, that's a, a story in itself. Uh, this, I, I, I was at the, um, the Polytechnic Regent Street. Uh, it was a uh, sort of technical school. Um, the school, the Quaker boarding school I went to, had not been used to go up, as, well, what in England is called have a sixth form. That's the last two years. Do you, you know about? Yeah. Um, and I was in the first sixth form of the school. The teachers really didn't know much about anything. Uh, I was studying. Uh, mathematics and physics. So basically I taught myself in the two sixth form years. They gave me textbooks um, and there were th four of us in what's called the science sixth form, not very big. Um, but while it was a good education in the sense of learning how to learn yourself, uh, excellent, uh, it didn't really give me too good a background. So the uh, entrance exams for the uh, universities I set for, I did not do very well. 
and I did not get into the universities I really had wanted to get into, but due to, again, a Quaker acquaintance, I was able to uh, get into the, uh, uh, the Polytechnic Regency, which actually was very good, uh, suited me fine. Uh, I, I was able to catch up on the things I hadn't learned because of lack of teachers in the sixth form. Um, I uh, graduated with a uh, degree in physics and mathematics, um, and then I was asked to stay on, uh, so being on the top of the class to do some research. Uh, again, that wasn't very good because in, in this polytechnic, uh, they hadn't been used to doing uh, research, but they wanted to get that started. Um, I was not satisfied. Uh, I uh, was able to obtain a job as a what was called a lecturer, a teacher, at a similar institution in Glasgow in Scotland. Um, the, it was called the Royal Technical College in Glasgow. It's now called the University of Strathclyde. Um, and um, I taught electricity magnetism uh, to very large classes there, first year classes. Um, but I tried to initiate some research of my own, again, without too much guidance. Um, and, um, yeah, um, I heard a uh, talk on, on the radio uh, given by uh, Charles Coulson, a well-known um, physicist, chemist, uh, which inspired me. I felt I was not going the right way, and I had got to know um, another scientist, uh, Kathleen Lonsdale, uh, later Dame Kathleen Lonsdale, which is a feminine way of knighting someone in England, because uh, um, uh, she had been uh, on the school committee where I was in a boarding school, French school, South and Walden. Uh, I wrote to her and she said, well, you can come and do a PhD with me in London. She was at the University College in London. Uh, uh, but uh, you need to get a scholarship, uh, which I did not get. Uh, but I had started, uh, she was a, what's called a crystallographer. Uh, I started studying crystallography on my own and discovered in the meantime that there was an eminent crystallographer at the University of Glasgow, where of course I was teaching. I wrote to him and he said, come and do a PhD with me while you're teaching at the Technical College. You can do research here, and that's exactly what I did. Uh, the institutions are about three miles apart. The uh, Royal Technical College is in the center of Glasgow, and, and the university uh, at that time was at the edge of Glasgow. Um, I used to cycle in between. Uh, so eventually I got uh, my PhD with uh, uh, the professor at the university in chemistry, um, uh, uh, Monteith Robertson was his name. Uh, and from there I became, I, I was, got, became interested in one of the visitors uh, from America who uh, had given us a lecture at the university. His name was Bill Lipscomb. Uh, and um, I was able to get a postdoc position with him. At that time he was at the University of Minnesota. Uh, soon I, I was with him for two years um, in Minnesota. I couldn't stay any longer because of the visa situation. Um, uh, but he left Minnesota uh, about a year after I left Minnesota, and he, he w then went to Harvard and still is at Harvard. Uh, he's uh, since then a Nobel Prize winner. And, uh, yeah, it's a nice opportunity. Hmm? Nice opportunity for you. Yes, of course. Days. Yes, always. Right. Yes, very, very, very good. Absolutely. Um, and. Um, while I was in Minnesota, uh, I had gone to a uh, international meeting in Montreal on crystallography. In Minnesota, I was do doing crystallography, uh, learning how to uh, use computers. Computers were completely new at that time. Nobody knew anything about computers, and they were slow, of course. Uh, but uh, it did give me an, a very important experience. Uh, anyway, at the meeting in, in Montreal, it was uh, I heard a lecture by a lady called Dorothy Hodgkin, also later a Nobel Prize winner, uh, uh, who was talking about uh, work on uh, which uh, 
reporting on work being done in Cambridge by uh, Max Perutz and John Kendall, uh, which interested me very much. Uh, I, having been trained as a mathematician, uh, this, uh, these, these, what they were doing was a challenging problem in math <coughs> mathematics. But um, they were really doing for quite different reasons, for bi biological reasons. Uh, Max Perutz was a chemist, uh, John Kendall was a chemist. Uh, um, anyway, I, I, I wrote to Max Perutz, and I actually also wrote to Dorothy Hodgkin, uh, who was doing similar work. Uh, she never answered, although later I got to work very closely with Dorothy. Um, but Max uh, Perutz did. Uh, so after two years in Minnesota, I joined Max, Max Perutz in uh, Cambridge uh, uh, as a member of the Medical Research Council, which is a, something like NIH here. Uh, and uh, this, this was a really fantastic experience, uh, very, very important experience. Uh, Max had been a student of Sir Lawrence Sprague in Cambridge, that's in the Cavendish lab, the physics lab. Uh, uh, but he wasn't really doing physics, and he was sort of exiled to a little hut outside, a very small hut, which happened to be there. And uh, other people, uh, Ma Max's group was quite small, uh, but included, for instance, Francis Crick, uh, do you, are you familiar with yes, Watson and Crick? Uh, yeah. This is the group where Watson and Crick did their work. Uh, and um, uh, every morning at 11 o'clock, everybody in the hut uh, had coffee in the sort of central collecting area. Um, and Francis was there holding out in a very loud voice, and he had conversations about all kinds of things. And it was a very stimulating, stimulating environment. And so the first year I was there, um, uh, we uh, obtained the first structures of proteins. I was working with Max on hemoglobin, John Kendall on myoglobin. Uh, John's work had actually come out, uh, you know, this is what Dorothy Hodgkin had reported on in Montreal, or at least it wasn't finished then. Um, but John's work was uh, got published, I don't know, 1957. I joined the group in 58. Uh, 59, uh, we had got the structure of um, a hemoglobin, and John's work had advanced to a higher resolution, uh, obtained detail which had sort of been predicted by Linus Pauling, who was in Caltech, an American. Uh, and, um, well, Max and John later got Nobel Prize for that work, um, and yeah, I was really the, the instrumental person. Max was mostly ill the first year I was uh, in Cambridge. He had stomach problems, and, uh, uh, but it was a really incredible environment, um, and I stayed on in uh, Cambridge for another five years on. Uh, working out mostly mathematical processes which are today the basis of what's called structural biology. Um, uh, but I couldn't stay in Cambridge. I didn't, it was a, you know, a series of temporary appointments. So um, I was looking around for a job. It wasn't actually very difficult to look around for a job. I didn't have to do any looking. They all came to me. And um, uh, one of them was uh, uh, here at Purdue, um, uh, the then head of biology, Henry Koffler, uh, uh, was uh, trying to get me to come to Purdue. And I had a number of, well, I think I had a total of six offers. Uh, but I felt that uh, Henry was uh, really interested in the work, uh, not just some sort of decoration for wherever I was going. So I decided to come to Purdue. And, well, uh, d I don't know, have I answered your question? That, what year was that when, what was when you came to Purdue? What year did you come? 64. Okay, yeah. all right. And uh, why don't you just take, take it from there and then some of the things that you've been doing since then. Um, I'll leave it up. One of the things, of course, you, you've done some mapping, but also the, uh, many of the, pr the things that, uh, the type of work I think it's shared that researchers could benefit by. I'll leave it to you to make some general observations. Um, 
Well, how uh, the focus has changed has it changed a little bit over time? Yes, okay. yes. Uh, so I had uh, been interested in in the structure of viruses. In fact, in one of the you know, rather uh, important papers which I published while I was in Cambridge, I mentioned that the methods I was developing might be suitable for uh, the study of viruses, for the structure of viruses. And so I had, uh, would have liked to, in a sense, did start with the study of viruses as soon as I came to Purdue, but it was kind of out of reach. Uh, it would, you know, most people would think that is a ridiculous uh, objective. It couldn't be done, you know, technically impossible. Uh, many questions about what viruses really were. Could they really be studied? Are they worth studying? They seem to be rather dead in nature, in, in some people's opinion. Uh, they didn't do anything. A virus you know, has a protective coat. It's just there to protect its genome. Um, that, that was the opinion of that time. Um, so uh, I felt I had to, first of all, establish myself as a competent, independent scientist. Um, and I uh, decided to study a series of enzymes which are you know, more within the technical range of what could be done, but still very challenging, and also had other certain specific properties which are appropriate to the kind of techniques which are similar in viruses and what I wanted to study. So I started studying in particular initially an enzyme called lactate dehydrogenase. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, they took six years to get the first results here at Purdue. Uh, Purdue was not at Cambridge. Uh, I felt a little off at the edge of the world, whereas Cambridge was clearly in the center of the world. We had visitors from all over the world, uh, interesting visitors. Um, but it, uh, in the end, we were able to, to obtain a structure of lactate dehydrogenase, and that uh, immediately initiated a study of another dehydrogenase called bisaldehyde 3 phosphate mm -hmm. dehydrogenase. Um, uh, and it turned out, and this I had kind of, uh, not exactly anticipated the way it was, but um, I had thought there might be some kind of structural relationship between um, various similar functionally enzymes, and uh, a colleague, a Swedish colleague, Carl Brendin, uh, uh, had actually had similar ideas. He was working on alcohol dehydrogenase, uh, and we did a lot of comparison of our work, which was quite exciting. Uh, he came here, and I went to Uppsala. In fact, that we had a, um, in 1971, I had a sabbatical in, in Uppsala. Uh, but that was after, the lactate dehydrogenase had been solved, and I felt that I went to Uppsala because uh, another friend from Cambridge, Boris Strandberg, had started work on a small virus in Uppsala. But he also, like me, had he, he was the first such scientist in Sweden, uh, and um, he ha had, like me, started work on enzyme carbonic anhydrase. Uh, as a way of verifying his competence, if you like, uh, as a, but never as of interesting thing. Um, and that's how I really got started on viruses when I had the sabbatical in uh, Uppsala um, in 1971. Uh, but uh, 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 around that time, 1973, actually, like back in my own lab, we had solved uh, determined the structure of glycosaldehyde 3 phosphate dehydrogenase. And um, I saw the, the, the obvious structural relationship. And then there was a meeting, actually also by coincidence, uh, uh, international meeting in biochemistry in, uh, in Stockholm, in Sweden, which I attended and presented the work. But I, there were a number of other um, results, one from uh, Georg Schulz from Germany uh, on uh, um, I uh, can't remember the name of the enzyme. Uh, 
a number of results which suggested to me that the uh, structure, the common structure between these de dehydrogenase, dehydrogenases uh, might be a very ancient structure which had uh, remained uh, constant over, fairly constant over uh, evolutionary space from the very earliest time of life on Earth. Um, and so this was very exciting and actually uh, also very controversial at the time. It's no longer controversial at all today. Uh, it's very well accepted. Uh, uh, and uh, that gave a certain degree of uh, exposure to work at Purdue, and it still does. Uh, um, uh, many places I go to uh, uh, today, I, I go around the world giving lectures these days, uh, uh, sort of ask me about, you know, they, they know of me because of, well, what's become known as the Rossmann Fold, which is this common structure. Uh, so they sort of, uh, depends who I talk to. Some people uh, are aware of our work here at Purdue, and my work uh, in terms of the mathematical background is something called molecular replacement. This was uh, what I developed in Cambridge and, and continued to develop and still is a, it, this is the most important tool, the most frequently used tool today in uh, molecular, in, in structural biology. Uh, so there's uh, that work I, which I initiated in Cambridge, and, uh, uh, which actually was not, uh, Max Perutz was not very keen on me developing this. He wanted me to work on hemoglobin. Uh, he, and he f did not really understand the mathematical aspect of it because uh, he was a chemist. Uh, but he was always very, very kind and, and really in many ways encouraged me. Oh, and that's where uh, I again got come back to Dorothy Hodgkin. Uh, it was Max who uh, said, well, you know, Dorothy has uh, a problem. She's working on insulin. And uh, in her, the crystals of insulin which she had looked at, there were certain properties. Uh, there were two molecules in the asymmetric unit. And that's exactly what uh, I was looking for. And so he got me in touch with Dorothy, and uh, one of the very first very exciting results of uh, the methods I was developing was a uh, discovery of the relationship between these two molecules uh, in, in, in the crystals of insulin. And this caused me to frequently have visits with, uh, to, Do to Oxford and vice versa uh, where, um, to exchange ideas and results. So that's where I got to work with Dorothy, although uh, I had originally written to Dorothy. And right, years back, right, yeah, yeah. yeah. interesting. Uh, yeah, uh -huh. um, so in the beginning then, at, in, at, when I was at Purdue, I was, you know, had to, to some extent, put the thoughts of working on the virus on hold. But as soon as we had uh, obtained some results on lactate dehydrogen, as I felt it really, was time to, to, to be more serious about viruses. And that's why I took the sabbatical in Sweden, where, where Strandberg was the one person in the world who was doing something about that. That's not actually quite true. Dorothy, again, had studied the same virus at an earlier time. And there was people like uh, Bernal and Fankuchen. Fankuchen was an American working in, uh, with Bernal in uh, Cambridge uh, and then in London. Uh, uh, who Bernal was an uh, uh, Irishman, actually, by working in England. Um, so it was not entirely unique, but still, where I wanted to go is in really into detailed structure. Uh, and again, uh, I can't say I was the only one. There, uh, Aaron Klug in, in Cambridge, uh, a South African, uh, who, who is still in Cambridge and later president of the Royal Society, uh, um, had been working on certain uh, viruses, including, for instance, poliovirus, but he had not pushed it so far. Um, so in uh, in uh, uh, 70, when I came back from my uh, sabbatical in Sweden, I, I really emphasized this uh, in, in my lab, although the enzyme work was still very much in, uh, active. Uh, but gradually, uh, the enzyme work faded out from my lab, and I started working more on viruses. Uh, we uh, studied uh, here um, first plant viruses because uh, all the greenhouses with, uh, at the back of Purdue are easy to get uh, to grow plant viruses, easy to extract them, they're simple in the chemical sense. 
uh, but lots and lots of it. So the emphasis then was on the technology of how to do this. And this developed uh, a variety of technologies and how to collect data, uh, on how to process the data, and how to use uh, the um, symmetry of the viruses to solve the structure. Um, uh, and all these things uh, we developed, and other people are developing also. Um, Steve Harrison in Harvard was working on tomato pushy stunt virus, uh, doing similar work uh, in Harvard. In fact, he uh, obtained the first such structure of a virus, uh, but we managed uh, a year later or so, uh, were able to. Uh, obtain another virus structure, and that really the interesting thing was the comparison of what he had done, what we had done, because again there was a, a similarity along the same lines I had anticipated for the dehydrogenases, that things of the same function would have similar structure, which is maybe obvious when you say it, uh, but uh, you never know what biology and evolution have done. Right, yeah. Well, the the, cold, the one for the cold the um, the cold virus was the one that structure was one of the ones that you did in 1985. Well, yes, you see, but first we studied plant viruses, which mm -hmm. was easier to study, mm -hmm. and then having had success there, it was very clear that NIH was anxious for me to work on something more human related, and that's how. I, and with a chance meeting of Roland Rueckert, who uh, from the University of Wisconsin, except I met him at a meeting in Strasbourg in France. Uh, um, I work, started working with Roland on, and his, his suggestion working on the common cold virus, uh, is it was much more difficult to work on an um, animal virus than a plant virus, because it it's much more difficult to produce it in quantity. And Roland uh, helped us to set up a lab here. Again, we were fortunate at Purdue. Uh, we needed a, a clean environment. And at that time, or just before that, there had been uh, problems with what's called recombinant DNA technology. That at that time had to be done in uh, a containment facility because there were uh, unnecessary fears about producing all kinds of nasty organisms. Um, and Purdue had built a special lab for this on top of the biochemistry department. But it was no longer wanted, and it was perfect for what, exactly what I needed. So I was fortunate to get one little cubicle in there for our work. Um, and again, uh, Purdue was very helpful. I got a uh, Showalter grant, uh, which helped me to equip this lab uh, for about $100,000. Um, uh, and so th that then, you know, some, so I, I think I, when I came back from, uh, uh, yeah, I came back from Sweden, did the plant virus work. Um, oh yes, I, I spent a, uh, another sabbatical in Cambridge, which was about 1980, and that's uh, that's actually another very significant thing because I, I worked with um, Richard Henderson uh, on the electron microscopy, and I realized how important electron microscopy would be. And when I came back. Um, uh, a number of things happened, but uh, it was recognized here that, in fact, that might be good to have some electron microscopy here. And we hired Tim Baker at, in the biology department, and uh, he immediately became interested in viruses uh, and showed us how to use electron microscopy in a three dimensional sense. Uh, and that has, today, this is a very, very significant thing which we helped to develop. Um, but by 85, so Tim, I was in on my sabbatical in Cambridge in 80, uh, and um, I came back, I continued working on the, on the uh, cold virus. Actually, that work just started, but by 85, we had got the structure, and it turns out that uh, the structure of the cold virus actually turned out to be very similar to the plant viruses, to everybody's amazement and surprise. Again, there's a functional relationship. There are viruses, there are RNA viruses. They work in much the same way. There are differences, of course. So this was, you know, they, they, there's a very close similarity in structure between the common cold virus and the early determined plant viruses. Um, so the, the plant virus work then opened up 
a whole host of things. First of all, we, we now have the technology for working on other uh, animal viruses. And I started working on parvovirus, on, on f uh, bacterial viruses. I started working on Phyx-174. Uh, again, the technology had made this possible, and uh, not only for us, uh, around the world, uh, the, the same technology started being applied. Um, and um, uh, then uh, some, th th this opened up at Purdue, you know, I, I got a, um, was able to get a, what's called a marquee, the same name as you. Uh, I was going to ask you about that center, yes. The no, no relationship, I assume. No, no the, the, the name is spelled differently. Oh, is it? Yeah, right. I-E-E-E. Yeah, I -E -E -E. yeah, yeah. right, yeah. Uh, the um, center that was opened, right. Yes, mm -hmm. um, that was because I was able to obtain a six or seven million grant uh, from the Marquis Foundation uh, which was absolutely incredible for us and allowed us to make some new hires, including, for instance, Richard Kuhn, who is now head of uh, biology. Uh, and Richard, uh, for Richard, it was, uh, yeah, it was his first faculty appointment, um, and he was interested in um, certain more complicated viruses, viruses which are more complicated than Picornavirus, uh, the common cold virus is one of many picornavirus. Pico means small, small RNA viruses. Uh, and with Richard, I started working on membrane viruses. And that, uh, things like dengue virus in particular, but also West Nile virus, yellow fever virus, and, and other related viruses. Uh, and, oh yes, I should mention, Synvis, which was the first Synvis virus, which are Ross River virus. Um, uh, which are other membrane encoded viruses. They're more complicated. They have a membrane, which makes the whole thing more interesting, how the virus enters in another cell. Uh, so this was another phase then, uh, having gone from plant viruses to simple animal virus. Now we're getting to more complex mm -hmm. animal viruses, which have membranes. Uh, uh, and so th that's about where we're now. We, um, Yes, a recent thing I read that, that you're working on in that particular area, which is good, yeah. How about uh, funding and the grants? Was that, how did that come about? Uh, that is well, uh, actually, I managed to get my first two grants before I ever arrived here. Uh, as I mentioned, Henry Koffler had been uh, trying to um, get me to come to Purdue, and when I had agreed to do that, he got me to, which I had never done before, apply to uh, uh, federal agencies, and I had an NSF grant, an NIH grant bef before I arrived. Uh, and they've, I, I still have a continuation of the same NSF grant even now. Which uh, is very nice. <laughs> yes, extremely so, right. And of course, you're, one of the, you've got that new electron microscope. Your equipment yes. has, well, technology has moved, and so has the equipment that you've got. Yes, uh, I mean, the, helps the, a lot. we now, in my lab, we now do more with electron microscopy than any other technique. Uh, so that's allowed us to get this new microscope, which isn't here yet because we're waiting for the installation in the, in the new building, which isn't finished yet. <laughs> yes, I was going to ask you earlier. A, a team, how do you build, uh, tell us about, you have a team and uh, how do you get your people to work together as a team that... Uh, well, uh, I, I think any I comments on that? like to tell you a story which Max Perutz used to tell me, uh, and it's very much the same here. Um, uh, Max built um, a lab, which I was one of the early members of. Uh, it's now a huge lab in Cambridge. They've moved from the center of Cambridge to the outside of Cambridge, uh, actually while I was there. Um, very successful lab. And the, uh, at the time when the Soviet Union was still around, the, uh, the Soviets sent a scientific delegation to find out how Max had built uh, this lab. Uh, and you know, they, this delegation asked him, you know, what planning had you done? And Max said, I had not done any planning. It just happened. And basically, that's my own answer. Yeah. Good, good <laughs> point. You've done a lot of collaboration, haven't you, with uh, colleagues in other countries? Yes, yes. And, uh, and you, does that allow you? They come here, and you go there, and yes. that is just, you know, yeah. that's, you've built that up over time too. I understand you're an adjunct at uh, Cornell. Yes. Uh, How did that come about? Well, uh, one of the tools which we had to develop uh, in the early days of the common cold virus, but now it's again, it's a very, very common tool. 
uh, is the use of synchrotron for our work. And uh, Cornell, they had built for the physicists uh, a synchrotron, uh, actually a tunnel. The Cornell is on top of a hill, and there's a tunnel which is uh, in the hill. Um, it goes around in a circle. Um, uh, so they, uh, and the, the way we use the synch synchrotron produces, for the physicists, a synchrotron produces radiation which they don't actually want. It's a byproduct, an unnecessary, an unhappy byproduct. But for us, it's exactly what we need. And that was recognized, in fact, by one of my Cambridge colleagues, um, uh, Ken Holmes, who uh, subsequently went to Germany to uh, lead one of the Max Planck Institutes in Heidelberg. Uh, uh, and the use of synchrotron radiation now as a dedicated uh, source for people like myself and others um, started to be developed in the early 80s, late 70s. Um, and Cornell had this synchrotron and had developed uh, a facility for using the radiation called CHESS, a Cornell High Energy Synchrotron Source. So we were one of the first users um, of um, that source and, and successful users where we did all the work on the common coal there. Um, and I started to be interested to have some facilities at Cornell, which I never actually developed, but they eventually uh, appointed me as an adjunct professor both in recognition of the work I had done there and to try to help me. Um, uh, I was at one time trying to think of actually slowly working up two labs in Cornell and here, but it didn't happen. Okay, well that was a nice thing. Um, yeah, you got quite a few. Uh, you're a mem uh, how about when you were a member of the National Science Board? Uh, what sort of involvement did that uh, bring for you? Well, I think I have a strong suspicion that the reason I came to be a member of the uh, National Science Board. Now, this is a, actually a presidential appointment. It's you know that Dr. Baring is... The exactly. He, <laughs> he, yes, he is now the, the chair, right. and I was one of the tellers that elected him. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, It's nice to have two people from Purdue that are involved in that. Yeah, and in fact, um, uh, uh, Arden Bermont, who is the director of National Science Foundation, is also a Purdue engineering professor. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you're well, very well informed. Um, so I, I think it's, uh, Rita Corwell, who was the previous director, was also was a, had been a graduate student at Purdue. Uh, I, I really appreciated uh, working with Rita. Um, and I think it's these connections which uh, somehow, I, I think Steve Baring, uh, suggested me, you know, goes up the line. And what was your involvement? And what did uh, what as a member of the board? What was your responsibilities, or what do you? What, just well, for a researcher, the board so meets every two months or so, and you know considers all manner of things. Uh, its its function, I don't think, is very well defined. It has two functions really. One is oversight of National Science Foundation, but that concept is repelled both by Rita, was repelled by Rita Corwell and Arden Berman. Uh, they don't want in any interference uh, from the board. Nevertheless, the board has to uh, give its consent to financial, uh, larger financial commitments, uh, particularly large um, uh, commitments on uh, research equipment. Um, the other thing is to uh, provide advice to the to the president uh, uh, as to scientific direction, and a lot of the work goes on into making uh, studies on current things, uh, current problems, uh, and that you know subcommittees are set up to study certain specific right. things. Like, do you report to the? There's a, an advisor for, to the president on sciences. Um, is, do you, yeah. is that where the reporting? Yes, so but also time. these uh, uh, studies are published in general, and, and I guess people take notice of it. I must say, you know, I was six years on the board. This was the term of my appointment, and I uh, did not make any effort to get uh, re, uh, re nominated, or whatever the word is. Uh, I don't know whether it's a very effective board, and I don't know. Uh, you know, I, I saw many things which I 
uh, I would disagree with in terms of the direction with NSF has taken, is taking. Uh, uh, Arden is very interested in computing, is not interested in biology. The financial support uh, which uh, NSF is giving for biology has been diminishing while I was on the board. Uh, every time there was a budget, it was less and less percentage for biology. Uh, I, I've repeatedly pointed this out. Uh, but hasn't got any effect. Uh, I, I, was, I, I, I was and am very concerned about the uh, um, large amounts of money that's going into centers uh, where a lot of scientists work together on, on something and brought together in somewhat artificial ways. Uh, I think that's contrary to the way science has developed uh, in, in the Western world uh, where the individual is the all-important thing. So the old... Uh, what well, NIH has been supporting for so long, the individual investigator, in, uh, individual investigator initiated research is what I think is the backbone of successful science anywhere in the world, always has been. Uh, and that is being diminished over the time, and I think uh, to our considerable disadvantage. I think there's a major crisis at the moment in America in the uh, discouragement of the younger scientists because there isn't enough uh, support for the individual investigator. Uh, they're just forced to join these large groups and faceless groups. Uh, uh, the result is that there's relatively little domestic uh, support uh, for, for scientists uh, or domestic um, uh, um, you know, native-born Americans are, are not opting to be scientists. Most people, it's not, I have no problem with this, but most, most newer successful scientists are from somewhere else in the world and come to America, like myself, uh, uh, because there's so much for those who've been there, you know, there is not the little incentive. On the other hand, you know, my incentive has always been the curiosity, the interest in science. Uh, I don't know where that's going. But I, I see there's a really uh, a crisis developed because of the method of science. There's been more and more NSF, NIH, that the program directors feel they, they want their stake in the science. They want to put a mark on the direction. Whereas in the, say, when I first came to Purdue, uh, the program directors were, were still are. They're very helpful, but they're not so much giving a direction, but giving help. The Ed, giving you the edge to move yeah, along. Yes, yes yeah. exactly. I'll talk about a couple of your awards. You're a member of the National Academy of Sciences and a Biophysical Society member. And you're a British and the Royal Foreign Member of the British Royal Society. That's right, yes. That's very nice. Yeah, and, I was uh, very happy with that. Yes, I, think, I would yeah. think so, right. And also, um, uh, you were, got an honorary doctorate from uh, Uppsala in Sweden. Yes, yes, yes. yeah. yeah. Um, well, now we have the... Uh, that Lucille Markley Strucker is biology that's still going, is it not? The center, the Lucille P. P. Markley Center for Structural oh, Biology. Oh, well, is it? Yeah, we still have that, that name. name. Uh, the money has long run out, uh, but we establish it in uh, recognition of where we really got started with the uh, Marquis money. Right. And that and was a very, very good source. All I had to do. Uh, you know, they, they, there's a Marquis Foundation, you had to apply. I made a small application. I was asked to see uh, a certain channel, Robert Glazer, uh, he was uh, dean of the medical school at Stanford University. I had a very pleasant interview with him, and that was, that was it. it. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Wish we all also that be yes. that easy. But now you're looking forward to your new, the new building. That, that's right, yes. Yeah. And that, uh, I had been pushing for that for a long time because uh, um, structural biology, which is what we do, is, is a, has become what was just an ivory tower uh, subject, uh, a very popular subject in universities and in industry. Uh, and we were really falling behind. We still are falling behind. Uh, so many other universities had uh, seen the light somewhat earlier than we have at Purdue. Uh, and um, we've lost a lot of people as a consequence, uh, which we needn't have done if we had um, uh, been able to 
uh, have uh, you know more up to date facilities at an earlier stage. But it's, it's going to be on, online. Was it next next year? It'll be open. Uh, I I believe it's supposed to be finished in September of next year. Oh. They're so looking forward to that. That'll be yes, very, that'll yes. Be so very the first nice. time I'll have windows to my office. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have windows either. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. You've been here a couple of presidents. Was it Dr. Hovde was was he the president when you came, or Dr. Hansen? Uh, yeah. Hovde, Dr. Hovde. Yeah. And then you've had um, with yeah. Dr. Baring and well, then there's Hansen. Right, and then and Dr. Then Baring and Dr. Yeah. Jeske. You get to get yeah. to know them then. Um, how about uh, new uh, department heads? You've had, you've had a few department heads that uh, you've yes, served Yes, quite under. a few. Right. And actually many of them, or some of them, I should say, not many of them, uh, have been associated from structural biology. So, for instance, well, Henry Koffler, of course, was the first. Sure. And he was a kind of structural biologist. He was interested in flagella. Uh, uh, um, and uh, he, he was followed, well, at Stutter Arnott was a head. Uh, and um, he, he was... Well, he was actually a fellow student of mine in Glasgow, um, and he... One what of a my small world. Yes, one of my first postdocs was one of his students, and then he frequently visited uh, his student and me, and eventually became a member of our faculty and, uh, in biology, and from that he was promoted to department head, and then he became uh, was he vice president for research or something like that. Right. Yeah. He's, no, he's no longer here, though. He's left. No, no. Oh. He, he left to become uh, the equivalent of president of the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. Oh, okay. Is he still, is he still there? No, he's yeah. retired now. Oh, is he? Yeah. Okay. All righty. Um, how about uh, a favorite Purdue tradition? You got any tradition? Or how about a, either that or an outstanding event in your life? So a favorite Purdue? A Purdue tradition or an outstanding event in your life that you'd like to share with us? An outstanding event. Yeah. So many events, uh, you know, something like when we realized what the structure of Rainer was, was like. It was very exciting. It was very exciting when we realized the relationship between these dehydrogenases. You know, these are sort of things which happen suddenly. Yes. Uh, what you've been working on and then yeah, all of a sudden yeah. it works. Yes, yes. Uh, And you never like to lose that, you know, that click. Oh, that's, that's really right. super. That's right, the uh, eureka moment. <laughs> that's right. And that's great. And that's yes. what makes it worthwhile. Cause, oh, yes. Cause yes. They don't, uh, when they come, they're great. And they that, don't come all the time. They, they come and they go. <laughs> right, I got you. Right. Because uh, as soon as the eureka moment has passed, they say, what next? <laughs> right. Where do we go next, yes, right? There you right. go. Right. In uh, closing comments, anything in summary that you'd like to share with the researchers? Uh, I'll leave it up to you. Or any questions that I did not ask that you'd like to share? Well, I, I suppose, uh, to me at least, the importance of science is to enjoy the discovery and the, uh, be motivated by the curiosity. Uh, today, the, uh, there's uh, so much concern about uh, Publications. Well, you have to publish because there's no point in doing your work if you don't publish. Nobody knows about it right, otherwise. Exactly. But uh, there's so much concern where you publish, how you publish, first author publications. This, I don't think, I ever worried about. You know, it didn't these problems didn't exist in the past? I am not sure what's happened. It's changed. So I, I think the important thing is the, the pleasure of the actual process of discovery and the, uh, the uh, persistent uh, work which has to go into to, to reach that. Yes, very good. Thank you, Dr. Ross. Sure. I appreciate You're that very, very much. Welcome. Okay. This concludes the interview.